Hello and welcome to First Lutheran Church here in Colorado Springs. I'm Pastor Travis Norton, senior pastor here. So glad that you found us online and we hope that this will be a time of worship for you, for you to connect with God. We're right in the middle of our sermon series on the book of Hebrews called Unshakable Faith. And today we're talking about the importance of worship and regular gathering with the, with the saints, knowing that there's more going on in our worship than meets the eye. So I hope it'll bless you today. But let's prepare our hearts for this time together in prayer. Father, we know that wherever we are right now, you are with us. We pray that you would make your presence known, that we can be part of that festal, festal worship in heaven, knowing that we are with you and you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her immediately, she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie, untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. What is it like for you to be a Christian these days? And how has it changed over the course of your lifetime? Before I, I took this call to be your pastor four years ago, during the transition, I had a, a long conversation with a former bishop of the ELCA. He had been a bishop in the church. He'd also served in other executive leadership roles in the church. And we were in my office just chatting about how things had changed. And he said for him, what he noticed from his role as bishop 
is that there was a lot less respect for pastors than there used to be when he started his ministry 40 years before. And he wasn't necessarily talking about respect from church members. He was talking about the respect society had or now failed to have for pastors. It used to be considered a noble thing to dedicate your life to the church, but it didn't seem to be the case anymore in the eyes of the world. And he was asking me how I felt about that, if I had experienced that myself. And I said, well, I really, I haven't been around long enough to know any different. It's always been the same for me. But what I have noticed is that Christians are not respected by the world as we once were. Society has changed. And in our place, and our place in this world has changed too. Christians used to be on top with all sorts of privileges that come with respect from society. Society used to work with the church, protecting Sundays, even Wednesdays, so that Christians could worship without conflict. But not anymore. Now we have to make choices. Do we take our kids to worship on Sunday or to the sports field? And frankly, that's old hat now. A whole generation has grown up having to make those decisions, trying to figure out what the right compromise is between our faith and our extracurriculars. But lately, though, it seems the changes have accelerated, and Christians are beginning to be looked down upon. Tell someone you're a Christian these days, and instead of looking at you with admiration and respect, you might instead get suspicion or hostility. Many look at Christians as the source of problems in our society, the source of prejudice, the source of oppression. And even we Christians, we look at ourselves and our brothers and sisters who share our faith, and don't we sometimes grimace at the things that they're doing? We see Christians mixing their politics too closely with their religion, diluting the purity of the faith, using it as a tool to achieve political ends and power. We see Christians marching under all sorts of different flags instead of just marching under the cross. And many of us are turned off by that. We don't want to be associated with the far left or the far right. It's easy to hold fast to our Christian faith when it's popular, when society respects us. It's easy to hold fast when things are clear, when we're all on the same page, it's much harder to hold to the Christian faith when we aren't being rewarded by the world around us. It's much harder to hold to the Christian faith when the church is divided and arguing about what's right and what's wrong. But take heart. This is nothing new. The church has been here before. The people who received the book of Hebrews were Christians who had questions and concerns and some had started leaving the faith behind. They were quitting Christianity because of how society viewed them. They were giving up meeting together, giving up worshiping together because their neighbors were looking down on them. They had once been proud of their faith, even enduring great trials because of it, but now as society got down on them, they got quieter about their commitments. They started backing away from their faith. They took worship for granted. They stopped meeting together as regularly. The book of Hebrews, then, is not a letter. It is a sermon. It's a sermon to the backsliders, to those who are tempted to walk away, to those who are in a spiritual malaise. And the author urges, reminds, teaches, exhorts, warns, and comforts us to hold fast to the faith. He's working to keep people together to help them resist the temptations to leave, to remind them what it means to be a Christian in the first place. And he reaches all the way back to the Old Testament, to the story of Esau and Jacob, and warns them and us not to sell our birthright for a bowl of soup. We need to keep our hearts and eyes focused on what faith is really about. And it's not about what we see right in front of us. It's not about what we see on the news screen. It's not about the rewards of privilege, prestige, or popularity that have gone away. We don't believe because it gets us the respect of others. We don't believe because it enhances our reputation. We aren't like Esau, 
who can't see the big picture and only saw the hunger and the bowl of soup. He sold out his future and his father's blessing so his immediate, temporary problem could be solved. And then the author sets up a comparison between two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. You remember the experience of Mount Sinai when Israel was at the base of the mountain while Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments and the people were afraid of God. They were focused on what they could see and touch. And what they saw was a mountain covered in darkness and lightning strikes all around it and they heard the the thunder and the rumbling and they felt the ground shake beneath them. They heard the voice of God too, but they rejected it because they were afraid. Don't speak to us again, they told God. It's too scary. But the author of Hebrews says to us, we are not like them. We are not like those who gathered at Mount Sinai. He says, we have come to a different mountain. We are the ones who have come to Mount Zion. And that changes everything, if we have faith to see. Now, I want to get a little technical with you for a minute, if you'll stick with me. Do we have any English teachers among us? Just a couple. Anybody ever have to diagram sentences when you were in school? Yeah. I thought this would be a good lesson for all of us who've gone back to school this week. When I read this passage, I kept stumbling over the verb tense in verse 22. It reads, but you have come to Mount Zion. And I kept thinking that it was wrong. It should read, you will come to Mount Zion. Because I wanted to preach the message I preached last week about the promise of heaven, about running toward the goal. If we just keep the future in mind, we can endure the present. But that's not what the passage says. It's not the verb tense. It's the perfect verb tense. Do you remember that? The perfect tense is something that has happened in the past but has ramifications for the present. Completed action, continuing results. Completed action, continuing results. The perfect tense. You still with me? So when the author says, you have come to Mount Zion, he uses the perfect tense. He's not talking about some future experience of heaven that we have to wait for. He's saying, you have literally come to Mount Zion. When you came to faith in Jesus, you came to a new mountain. You're under a new covenant. Your whole life was changed. You know, sometimes when we get discouraged in our faith, we just need someone to remind us of the truth that is right in front of us that we've forgotten how to see. We need someone to open our eyes to the gifts all around us so we don't take for granted the goodness of God that is in our presence. So we don't walk away from the treasures of God for a bowl of soup or a mountain of fear and trembling. You have come to Mount Zion, a place of joy, a place of heavenly worship. You are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's not something we have received. It's not something we will receive in the future. It's happening now because you have come to Mount Zion and the effects are ongoing in our lives. Remember it says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Not were, not will be, but are. We are surrounded right here, right now. This beautiful description of heavenly worship that describes Mount Zion is happening right here in our midst, and it matters for us today. The question is only, do we have faith to see it? Do we have faith? Remember how the author describes faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of what? things unseen. The author reminds us that this changing world full of fear and confusion is not the whole world, is not the full truth. There is another mountain. There is a fuller truth that can only be received through faith. He says, don't miss it. 
Don't miss it. Don't walk away from the gift that you've been given. Do you remember that? I'm realizing in the sermon that all my movie references are dated, but do you remember the, the movie about Peter Pan played by Robin Williams? You remember the, the scene where he's supposed to sit down uh, for a feast with the Lost Boys, and he's still, he's a grown-up Peter Pan, he's lost all of his imagination, all of his play, and he sits down for this great feast, and all he sees are empty platters and dishes on a table. And the lost boys start chowing and eating, and he has no idea what's going on. And they say, you've lost lost your imagination, Peter. And so he takes an invisible spoon, and he scoops up invisible dessert, and he goes to flick it at somebody to start a food fight. And as soon as he does that, his faith comes back, his imagination comes back, and there's a plop of ice cream on somebody's face. And all of a sudden, his eyes are opened, and he sees the great feast before them every plate filled with food and sweets and goodies. That's the mountain we've come to. Hebrews is reminding his hearers of what some had forgotten. Maybe what some of us have forgotten too. I'm going to do an experiment. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to hear this passage again through the eyes of faith. Listen to these words. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You can open your eyes. Do you see it? Right here, right now, you are in the presence of angels. You are in the great cloud of witnesses. You are with the saints of old and the citizens of heaven. Right here, right now, you are in the presence of the living God. You are in the presence of Jesus. You have come to God. You have come to Jesus. Not a mountain that can be touched, but Mount Zion that is received by faith. What do we say each week in our communion liturgy before we sing the Sanctus? We say, and so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We believe that there is more going on in this room than meets the eye. We believe that we are worshiping the living God here, that the Holy Spirit is moving and active among us. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them, says Jesus. We believe that when we worship, we join the song of heaven. We are with all believers in heaven and on earth around the throne of God, singing our praise to the one who didn't withhold even his own son. This is the truth. This is the reality. This is how we see the world. Think of that famous scene from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when they come to the Bridge of Faith. You remember that? There's a bridge there over the chasm, but they can't see it. It's disguised. It's hidden. It can only be appreciated through faith by taking that first step. The reality of this world is that God is present, that heaven is here, that we sing with angels and saints in worship, and when we have faith, then we can see it then we can gain our encouragement and strength. You are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. You have come to the mountain of joy, the mountain of festal worship, the mountain where God speaks, where God has spoken, and God has spoken to each one of you and continues to speak to you today. At this table, God says, Here is my son, given for you, his body, his blood. Your sins are forgiven. Your When you were baptized, God said, you are my child, my son, my daughter. 
Here are the gifts I give to you, the Holy Spirit. You are called to serve. These words are truth, and they will always be true. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken and will fade away. But what is true, what we are receiving, cannot be shaken and will endure forever. When I was younger, there was a, a song that we used to sing, and, uh, and Bonnie, our guest organist, actually played it at last service between the communion liturgy, so maybe she'll do that again for us. There's a song we usually sang with a guitar around a campfire. I'm not going to sing it to you. I'm not that brave. But I will tell you what it said. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can see his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Today we've gathered for worship. And the Lord is here. Today, the angels are singing, and we join with the saints of heaven. Today, God is speaking. Don't miss it. You have come to the mountain of Zion. That is the reality. Fix your eyes on Jesus and worship the living God. Amen? Amen. 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 We do pray that God spoke to you today through the message. If you want to take next steps, we've created an online course called Basic Training that goes through the basics of the Christian faith uh, step by step. So I encourage you to take that. That's also on this YouTube channel. I encourage you to support this ministry online through your tithes and offerings. You can do that by going to our website, www.flccs.net. And then also in the description of this video, you'll see a link to a connection card. That's a great way to contact us. Let us know if you are moved to come to faith during this time. If you're ready to talk to a pastor about next steps, we'd love to talk to you there. Just let us know that you were here and any comments, we appreciate that. May God bless you as you continue to walk with the Lord. <music>